Mevrouw de rector Magnificus. This is a climate crisis. And science hasn't been able to prevent it. The science underpinning the greenhouse effect has been known for almost a century now. Thousands of papers, dozens of reports, but all those efforts by the academic community have not put an end to the rise in carbon emissions. Why has academia failed to avert the climate crisis? And what can we, academics, do to turn the tide? How do we fit into the narrative? In a society where the youth glues itself to traffic intersections, private jets, fine arts, how activistic should academics be? I am very excited to have been appointed as Professor of Oceanography and Public Engagement. And in the coming 40 minutes, I will explain why the combination of oceanography and research into public engagement is such a good fit. And also convince you how we, academics, can be more effective in our interaction with society. My argument starts with the ocean. Society is terra-centric, too focused on land. But more than 70% of the surface of our planet is covered by ocean. Why do we even call this planet Earth when it is so clearly planet water? I remember very well the first, uh, when I first felt the immensity of the ocean. It was on the research vessel Pelagia, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. We'd been at sea for four weeks, and the captain called a man overboard practice. We all had to put on our swim gear and jump in. There I stood, 800 kilometers from land, four kilometers of water beneath me. I was so scared, but also intrigued by the mysteries below me. From then onward, I wanted to become an oceanographer. We know less of the deep ocean than of the surface of Mars. Yet, the ocean is crucial to climate. 26% of the extra carbon dioxide that is emitted into the atmosphere is absorbed by the ocean. You can think about this as a discount, courtesy of the ocean. Emit a ton of, of carbon dioxide and deal with only 750 kilograms of it. Because the ocean will absorb the other 250 kilograms. What a fantastic deal! Without the ocean, carbon dioxide levels would have been much higher than they are now. So let us say, thank you, ocean. But this service comes at an environmental cost. The absorbed carbon dioxide decreases the pH of the ocean. This makes it more difficult for corals and some plankton to build a skeleton. Furthermore, the carbon dioxide that does remain in the atmosphere traps extra heat. And most of that heat is absorbed by the ocean. This leads to warming, um, and, and that affects the ecosystems when organisms must ad adjust. And it also leads to sea level rise, because warmer ocean water expands upward. The ocean is thus facing a double whammy of warming and acidification under increased carbon dioxide levels. But it's not only climate change that affects our ocean. Our economic system has allowed global society to exploit the ocean at an unprecedented scale. Industrial scale fishing has diminished many commercial fish species to near extinction. And for those fish species that can still be caught, the fishing methods are now so efficient that fishing can be considered more like harvesting than like hunting. Moreover, ship engines and other marine activities create an enormous amount of noise, which drowns out the sounds that whales and the other marine mammals use to communicate with each other. And then there's, of course, the plastic pollution. I'll come back to the issue about the intricate relation between plastic pollution and climate change later. 
but it is obvious that a large amount of plastic waste that lingers in our ocean does not benefit ecosystem health. All these perils are a threat to our ocean. Ocean, not oceans. While at school, you may have learned about the five or the seven oceans. From the point of view of an organism living in the ocean, there is only one. Unlike land-dwelling organisms, marine organisms could in principle go from any location in the ocean to any other, without ever having to leave the ocean. All regions of the ocean are fully connected. But that doesn't mean that all organisms always move throughout the entire ocean. Most can't, because most are at the mercy of ocean currents. And this interaction between physical oceanography um, uh, of ocean currents and the biogeography of marine ecosystems is what gets me really excited. Ever since my PhD 15 years ago, I've been interested in how ocean currents move stuff around. This is called the Lagrangian perspective or framework, and it's especially powerful for analyzing connectivity. How and on what scale, um, what time scale is material transported from one location to another? My PhD research was on analyzing the connectivity and transport of water, heat and salt between the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean and how that impacts global climate. During my eight years abroad, I've collaborated with marine geneticists who wanted to understand how species move from one location to another and wi uh, which environmental conditions and thus environmental selection they experience during their journeys. And in the last 10 years, I've used connectivity analysis to investigate the plastic polluting our ocean and how ocean currents transport plastic and where that all ends up. I'm so lucky all these years to have been surrounded by inspiring good-natured supervisors, colleagues, collaborators. It's thanks to the more than 40 postdocs, PhD students, masters and bachelor students and interns in the Utrecht Ocean Parcels team that we've become this successful. The people on the Ocean Parcels team have worked tirelessly to develop and apply novel computer codes and analysis techniques on marine plastic pollution, plankton, seaweed, sea ice, oil, tuna and nutrients. And I look forward to working with my wonderful Ocean Parcels team. I also look forward to working uh, with my equally wonderful new team at the Freudenthal Institute's Public Engagement and Science Communication Group. More on that later. Special thanks go out to Henk Dijkstra, who supported my return to Utrecht, and to Isabel Arendt, Stan Pieter, Stefan van Doren, and Femke de Boer, who offered me this opportunity to create this unique professorship in oceanography and public engagement. Now, add to that the 660 fantastic and inspiring collaborators and co-authors, and I can really say that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I am fully aware and appreciate that I'm privileged, and realize that not everyone has access to these chances and opportunities. Perhaps it's time to make iedereen professor. Recently, my team and I have started a new oceanographic research line. I want to play the blame game. Whose plastic is that you find on a beach? We use a Bayesian inference framework to analyze the virtual plastic trajectories that, uh, that we simulate with our open source parcel software. I want to focus on macroplastic, the, items, the plastic items larger than roughly five centimeters. These larger items don't get nearly as much media attention as micro and nanoplastics because their ecotoxicological impact is much less. Simply put, there are only a few large species of marine animals that can swallow an entire soda bottle. But almost all organisms in the ocean can inadvertently ingest a nanoplastic particle. And that nanoplastic particle may then also be much more toxic when it transfers into organs. So while the impact of the larger macroplastic items may be less, there are at least five reasons 
why solutions to marine microplastics should start with cleaning up microplastic pollution and then specifically on the beach. First of all, my team found that large plastic items constitute more than 95% of all mass of plastic in the ocean. So, by cleaning up macroplastic, we remove most plastic mass. Secondly, we found that most large plastic in the ocean originates from land, and that the plastic that does come from land stays near the coastline for a very long time, constantly bouncing back and forth between the beaches and coastal ocean. Third, we also found that most fragmentation of plastic from large sizes to micro scale happens on coastlines. Realize that a one and a half liter plastic bottle could in principle fragment into a million microplastic particles. Every large plastic item removed thus avoids a plethora of microplastics entering the ocean. Now the fourth reason is one that many of you will actually be particularly excited to learn. Cleaning up a beach is good for your mental health. The mental health benefit of a beach walk where you pick up a plastic litter that you find is even higher than of a beach walk where you try to ignore the plastic. And finally, if you ever want to hold the polluters accountable, so this is five, then that will probably be most feasible for macroplastic because the origin of large plastic items may actually be identifiable. How? I envision an interdisciplinary research program where oceanographers, archaeologists, chemists, biologists, geneticists and legal scholars collaborate to build a minimum evidence base for accountability of who has responsibility for the plastic items found somewhere in the ocean or on a beach. In this program, oceanographers stimulate the transport of large plastic items. Archaeologists construct a history of the item by considering it as an artifact. Chemists assess the degradation state and isotopic composition of the plastic item. Biologists and geneticists identify the algae that have attached to the item, which inform about its provenance. And legal scholars identify what a minimum level of confidence is before an actor, which can be a person, a company, or even an entire industry, can be held accountable. I'm confident that in the not too distant future, this will all be possible. Let me share you an example from the Litter ID workshops organized by my colleagues Wouter Jan Strietman and Ilko Lehmans. In this project, a group of volunteers helped completely clean up a beach on Svalbard, north of Norway in the Arctic Ocean. When they were done, the team categorized all items. A pile of fishery-related items, a pile of food packaging, a pile of bottle caps, a pile of cigarette butts, etc. And then they carefully analyzed, using techniques and methods from archaeology, the peculiarities of the items in each category. And it was when they reached the cosmetic packaging pile that they made a very interesting and important observation. That almost all items in the cosmetic packaging were from male cosmetic products. Male shampoo bottles, male deodorants. The question, of course, is why this bias? It's not because male shampoo bottles drift differently than female shampoo bottles. <laughs> it's not. No, it's most likely because most plastic ending up on Svalbard beaches comes from male-dominated fishing vessels. So here, we have a proverbial smoking gun. The prevalence of male products points to a certain industry from a certain country being the polluter. If we can further fine-tune this analysis to point to individual ships, might we have a court case? Because throwing plastic waste overboard is prohibited both by national and international law. Now, of course, we shouldn't develop such a program solely within academia. 
Building the evidence base to successfully sue polluters requires active engagement with organizations that work on the ground by cleaning up beaches. We can do this within the Dutch context on Dutch beaches, and my collaborators at Stichting de Noordzee, for example, have years of experience uh, organizing beach cleanups. And hence know a lot of the types of, of items found on Dutch coastlines and when and where they arrive. But it might be even more impactful to do this on small island developing states that bear the brunt of the plastic pollution issue and where the financial incentive of clean beaches for tourism is even higher. On my recent sabbatical, I spent a month on Curaçao. While a tropical island from a tourist perspective, Curaçao faces many socioeconomic and environmental problems, from brain drain and poverty to wastewater management and coral demise. While plastic pollution on their beaches is perhaps not the most pressing of these problems, it is the most visible. I joined a local beach cleanup and was shocked by what I saw. So much plastic litter. And from my discussions with academics on Curaçao, I did realize that the visibility of plastic and its close connection to socioeconomic and personal activities on land can be an effective entry point for an island-wide public discussion around sustainability. And that is the core of this inaugural lecture. I am convinced that the ocean can provide an extraordinary entry point for public engagement on sustainability. The ocean may not play a ro central role in most people's life. Most people do have a notion of the ocean as exciting, mysterious, perhaps even romantic. There's a reason that so many people go on beach holidays and are then actually willing to pay a premium for a hotel room with an ocean view. There's a reason that many people love diving and snorkeling. That 10% of Dutch households have an aquarium. That Finding Nemo is the best-selling DVD of all time. <laughs> There's something special about the ocean. And know that where I say ocean, I mean all saltwater bodies, including seas and large estuaries. I'm inclusive in my definition of the ocean. As I said before, there's just one ocean. It's all connected. It's not useful from the public, uh, public engagement point of view to distinguish between seas and ocean, or even between the Pacific, Indian, or Atlantic Ocean. Internationally, this framing is strongly supported by the hashtag drop the S movement communicating that we should use the phrase ocean instead of oceans. In Dutch, this could be hashtag maar een oceaan, with a head tip to Kim van Ommering. Now, why does this matter? Because one ocean helps to convey the communality and uniqueness of the ocean. The ocean is unique because it belongs to no one. The ocean is together with Antarctica and outer space, are only true global commons. But where only a very few people have been on Antarctica or in outer space, everyone can experience being in or on the ocean. Sure, most people's direct experience with the ocean is coastal bound, but the ocean currents will make sure that anything that happens there can get transported to the open ocean. This gives everyone on a beach holiday a particular responsibility. Don't lose your sandals, or they might wash up on the other side of the globe. And it also gives uh, us all as society a responsibility, because the open ocean is so poorly protected. As New York Times journalist Ian Urbina called it in his book, The Outlaw Ocean, the ocean is our last wild west where mass-scale overfishing, willful pollution, human trafficking, and even modern-day modern slavery are not uncommon. And then don't forget the effects of climate change that I discussed before. 
Now the flip side to this doom and gloom and criminality is the ocean's beauty. The endless horizon from standing on a beach, the magnificent sunsets, the raw power of the waves, and not least the amazing marine animals. Especially what marine biologists sometimes denigratingly refer to as charismatic megafauna. The dolphins, the whales, the turtles, the cute clownfish. These organisms are not the innocent victims of our care. No, no, sorry. These organisms are the innocent victims of our careless use of the ocean. So, like every good story, the narrative of ocean sustainability has both villains and victims, which then begs the question. Where's the hero? Perhaps the main question underpinning the combined remit of my professorship is, should ocean scientists take the role of the heroes? Before I make a start answering that question, and since we're at the topic of terminology and wording, I want to take you into a small digression. Before I left my uh, sabbatical this autumn, I promised some of you to think of a different term for public engagement. Because there's a problem with the term public engagement. It does not mean anything outside of academia. As academics, we might understand that we refer to meaningful interactions between academic and non-academic publics. But to someone at a company or in government, this relation to academia is not at all clear in the term public engagement. It's an outward-looking term, and this implies us and them. But, what is exactly, but that is exactly the ivory tower concept of academia that we want to get rid of. Now, furthermore, the term public engagement misses the opportunity to convey the motivation. Why do we do public engagement? When I get asked what the essence of public engagement is, I say it is research with and for society. So, but professor of oceanography and research with and for society is a bit of a mouthful. As a shorthand version, and I've thought very long and hard about this, and please, please help me with a better term, but as a shorthand version, I could live with the phrase society activated research. In Dutch, that would be samenleving geactiveerd onderzoek. I appreciate that this is still somewhat vague, but it's a phrase that can be loaded with, for example, the different activities that we here in the Utrecht Open Science Platform file under public engagement. Science communication activates society by increasing scientific literacy. Stakeholder engagement activates academia by providing societally meaningful use cases for research. Citizen science activates both society and academia by enlisting non-academics in research. And co-creation also activates both society and academia by asking the research questions that matter most. Let's see if the term sticks. So let's explore how this society-activated research works in practice. A useful case study is the science communication around marine plastic pollution and how, it, how that compares to science communication on ocean climate change. As I stated in the beginning of this inaugural lecture, we are in a climate crisis. And this worries me tremendously. Yet, most of the research in my team in the last 10 years has been on plastic pollution. Now, these two topics, of course, are related but they are not the same. Plastic pollution is an atrocity. Society should be ashamed that we let it come this far, that plastic can now be found everywhere, from the deepest depths of the Mariana Trench to the sea ice of the Arctic. But plastic pollution does not pose an existential threat to our livelihoods and the structure of our socio-economic system as the climate crisis does. It's not even entirely clear how harmful the current levels of marine plastic pollution really are. 
So don't get me wrong, I am not a plastic denier, but what keeps me awake at night is the looming climate catastrophe. Yet the science communication and so society-activated research of my team and myself focuses on our plastic pollution work, partly because that's well, where the funding comes from, and also because that is what most outreach requests are for. But here's what I now wonder about. Does communicating about plastic pollution distract from the climate crisis? Do people who hear from us about plastic pollution research then improve their recycling habits and then book a flight to Thailand? Or, on the other hand, does the visibility of plastic pollution reinforce the idea that local socioeconomic choices can have remote impacts? What's, interested about, what's interesting about plastic pollution is that people refuse straws because they might end up in a turtle's nose. Now, a strangled turtle is a very visual and uh, uncanny image, and that has been extremely effective in putting plastic pollution in the public spotlight as a serious issue. So answering this question about the perception of plastic pollution versus climate change requires sociological research, something that's beyond my own remit and expertise. But what I do consider my remit is investigating how academics can be most effective in science communication. Or, phrased in another way, what is the added value of academics in communication? The landscape of science communication professionals is very diverse. Key players are, of course, the journalists, both employed by media organizations and self-employed, but also the communica communication officers at universities and research institutes, the vloggers, bloggers, TikTokers, other influencers, and then the academics ourselves, themselves. Most of us in the last category have no formal training in communication strategies. And even if we do have training, the ideas underpinning science communication are very rarely evidence-based. As my colleague Jonica Smeets has said, it is surprising that every step of the scientific workflow has a protocol except science communication. Then we steer on intuition. We do science communication because we enjoy it. Now, while that might be a good intrinsic motivation, it's not effective. And what's more, until very recently, none of the academics were even recognized or rewarded for their communication activities. The academics are the amateurs in a field full of professionals. So why and when do they then have added value? And should they take out time of their very busy schedules to engage in public dialogue? Now, the core of that answer to that question lies in trust. According to the Rathenau Institute, public trust in academia is high. In their March 2020, uh, 2022 report, Dutch people rate their trust in wetenschap with a 7.4 out of 10, which is more than the trust in the courts of law, the media, and politics. And perhaps surprising to some of you, the Dutch public trust in academia has even gone up during the COVID pandemic. So even though I sometimes hear academics grumbling that there's so little trust in society, based, for example, on the explicit refutation of science by COVID and climate deniers, I am more optimistic because the silent majority does trust the academics. It is this public trust in science and academia that science, co science communication should leverage on. This suggests that indeed academics should take on the role of the trusted hero. And science communication shouldn't focus on outcomes, but on the process. As Nieske Vergunson said, Scientists should communicate better how the sausage is made. Well, I've been a vegetarian for more than 15 years now. I do endorse that metaphor. It's much more important how science is done and why 
than what the results are. Now, during my sabbatical, I met with Professor Edward Maybach, one of the leading climate communication experts in the US. His idea is that effective climate communication is organized in triangular collaborations within a communication professional, a communication scholar, and a climate scientist. I subscribe to this idea, but I also think that the dependency on the climate scientist is perhaps smaller than on the communication professional and a communica communication scholar. Prompted by these two, the climate scientist takes on a role, is an actor, more a spokesperson of the field than an individual. The IPCC reports are so comprehensive and the consensus among climate scientists is so large that most climate communication is not very different from undergraduate teaching. All climate scientists should be able to do it. When I worked in Sydney, I participated in a climate communication traineeship organized by the Climate Council. Back then, the climate debate in the media in Australia was very hostile. There was much denialism, likely fueled by the powerful mining industry. In order to protect climate scientists from personal attacks by the deniers, the Climate Council wanted to broaden the pool of climate scientists that were comfortable to speak it to the media. Because the more voices for climate science there are, the more difficult it is to get personal. Australian oceanographers, meteorologists, paleoclimatologists, and other climate scientists had made a front. They are exchangeable. And that is important to realize because it touches upon the question of scope of expertise. Many academics will have experienced expertise creep um, when they engage in science communication. How do you answer a media question when you're on a talk show that's beyond your own expertise? How even can you define the limits of your expertise? Now ask my oceanography colleagues and they will say that my expertise is Lagrangian oceanography and how currents move stuff around. Ask my students and they will say that my expertise is physical oceanography, the topic of the courses I teach. Ask my family and friends, and they will say my expertise is climate physics, the topic of my master's degree. So we let our expertise be defined by others, and that can lead to uneasiness. When I am interviewed by, for example, the NOS on a topic that I haven't published for in the last three years, I am more worried about the responses of my direct colleagues than by that of my mother. In a field, where we need as many people and, and as many voices as possible to communicate the dire state of our climate, that is not a healthy situation. Of course, it depends a bit on the type of media, but my own working definition of what my expertise is, is roughly any topic that I'd feel comfortable to lecture about in an undergraduate class. So, back to this question, whether climate scientists should take on the hero role. I can't deny that it would be awesome to come in and save the day. But I don't know many climate scientists who actually see themselves as heroes. And I don't either. The problem is that I just don't have a silver, silver bullet solution. When we recently analyzed um, the roles of scientists in press releases about oceanographic research, the role that was mostly used was that of Warner. Oceanographers positioned themselves as the proverbial canaries in the coal mine. But then it becomes really interesting because <coughs> it's only a small step from Warner to activist. There are many definitions of what activism is in academia. But for now, let's assume that an academic is activistic when their goal is to reduce the number of policy options by advocating for one policy option over another. For example, advocating for a radical reduction in greenhouse emissions versus 
advocating for uncurbed growth. Now, is activism a necessary part of taking on a war in a role? No. An academic can, in principle, only warn about the climate crisis and remain, uh, refrain from promoting certain policies. Many, activi uh, many academics, in fact, think that this is the ethical way to engage. And it is what, what is meant with the role honest broker of policy options. But others state that it is near impossible for academics to refrain from advocacy. Even the act of submitting a competitive grant proposal could be seen as activistic, since the outcome of any uh, competitive call is for tax money to be steered towards only a few research projects, and therefore necessarily diverting funds away from other research projects. So it's advocating for one over the other. But of course, academics can still choose to be more or less activistic in their en public engagement in science communication. The research question I'm interested in is whether it is effective to be activistic. Does engaging activistically hurt the credibility and trust of climate scientists? You may intuitively think it does, since activism essentially means choosing sides. But there's empirical evidence that it doesn't need to be that way. In fact, the public may even expect climate scientists to be activistic. This is suggested, for example, by an experiment in 2017 in the US where they assessed how people rated the credibility of a climate scientist statement in a variety of press releases. They found that the credibility at 5.2 on a scale from 1 to 7 was independent of the amount of activism that the climate scientist put in his press releases. Whether the climate scientist only talked about the latest results of a simple study and very technical, or was very activistic and called for specific policies to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Does this not hurt the credibility? And this is not, only, this is not the only evidence that trust and credibility are not at affected by activism. In a 2020 survey of German and US citizens, the majority of respondents support policy advocacy by climate researchers and expect public enge uh, political engagement. And so, by the way, did the majority of climate scientists. There's no data for the Netherlands yet, but I'm very keen to find out if it also holds here. In the meantime, I will work under the hypothesis that the public expects me and my fellow climate scientists to scream as loud as we can if we see anything in our data that society should be alarmed about. Because that is why society invests in climate scientists. And speaking of worrying about climate change, perhaps this is a good moment to reveal the results of our climate stemming. This was the experiment that you all participated in, uh, which I developed with Frank Goethals from Studio Tegenwind, Kalein van den Broeke from the Copernicus Institute, and the Climate Help Desk. We asked everyone to provide answers to two questions. How worried are you about climate change? And how worried do you think the others in this inaugural lecture are? And we did this because we want to measure whether people have an accurate idea about the li level of climate anxiety among their peers. So let's see what the outcomes are. And I'll translate it for my colleagues here. There he goes. Ta -da! So what we see is that most people themselves are 
either quite worried or extremely worried, but that most people think that the others are quite worried or extremely worried or reasonably worried. And you see that there's a much more shift towards reasonably worried for the others than there is for what you think yourself. And this is, luckily, <laughs> what I expected. <laughs> Hypothesis correct. When we premiered the Klimaatstemming at the Bedwater Festival last October, we found, indeed, like here, that most visitors expected their peers to be quite worried, but that most of them were actually extremely worried themselves. I spent an hour at the end of the Bedwater Festival discussing these results with the visitors as they passed the unveiled Klimaatstemming, as when they left Tivoli Vredeburg around midnight with a beer. And as we anticipated, the outcome provided some comfort to many people. They were not alone, they were not alone in their climate anxiety. One person told me she would sleep better knowing that so many others are worried too. I hope that the results of this afternoon can also provide you some comfort if you need it. But what then for those colleagues who feel uncomfortable about the activistic stance? Well, activism doesn't need to be angry and explicit. In a 2007 paper entitled Non-Persuasive Communication About Matters of Greatest Urgency, decision scientist Baruch Fischoff ended with a beautiful paragraph that is right on point. Begin quote. Scientists who avoid science advocacy can still engage in value advocacy by speaking about the things that they cherish. As seen in the success of science films and centers, the passions of scientists often matter to non-scientists. Like artists, scientists have a special sense for the uniquely meaningful features of the world around them, enabling them to speak with an authenticity that goes beyond technical estimates of the costs and benefits of climate-related decisions." End quote. Fischoff is right that the roles and opportunities for academics are similar to those of artists. In fact, art can be a very powerful conduit for science communication. It is not sufficient to communicate scientific facts. Science communicators should also use the emotional doors to the hearts of their audience. Artists know much better how to do that. I must confess, I'm not much of an artist myself, but I do often get touched by art. You may have recognized the music that Jaap Jan Steensma played on the organ when the cortege entered, and which he will again play when we soon leave. It's Beds Are Burning by the Australian band Midnight Oil. And I chose this song because back in 2009, when I finished my PhD, it served as a protest song for climate justice and the climate movement. Originally written by Midnight Oil to support the emancipation of the aboriginals, the text of the chorus is, how can we dance when our earth is turning? How do we sleep while our beds are burning? The song is an expression of rage and anger about climate injustice. Now it can be scary, but powerful, to incorporate emotions in science communication. One of my most memorable climate communication moments was when I gave a lecture about the impacts of climate change in the ocean to a group of master's students in a marine science program three years ago. An hour into the lecture, after showing dozens of figures detailing the many dangers of climate change for ocean ecosystems, I couldn't take it anymore. I broke. I started crying. I had to stop the class and left the classroom. I don't think 
I've ever given a more impactful lecture than that one three years ago. I expect it made a lasting impact on many of the students. It surely made a lasting impact on me. It made me realize that the scientific cognitive message needs to be aligned with the emotional message for it to be understood by the audience. A mismatch between emotional and scientific message creates cognitive dissonance. So climate scientists in the room, please don't smile when you discuss the climate crisis. The audience won't understand it. But they do realize, of course, that anger is a very negative emotion. So what then? For my own sanity, I try to use more positive emotions. And reflecting official's observation that the passion of scientists often matter to non-scientists, I'm settling on passion. I hope I've conveyed you mine, and I look forward to hearing all about your passions at the reception. Ik heb gezegd.